Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast around health literacy and workforce well-being. This is Seth Serksner, Chief Health Officer at EdLogix, and I'm welcoming today Jennifer Jones, who's Enterprise Practice Leader at Springbuck, for a conversation today. Really appreciate you joining us today, Jen. Really looking forward to this. You and I have been chatting and you've given me some of your background, but I'd love for you to just take a minute and share with the group kind of your career path, kind of a little bit of a circuitous one, as you just mentioned to me, and how you've ended up at a data analytics firm. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me. I'm really excited for our conversation today. But yeah, as you mentioned, I'm currently with Springbuck. I'm our enterprise practice leader. But as we were talking before, my background has been a winding path. I'm actually a registered dietitian by trade and spent several years working in various hospital settings and patient outpatient. At one point in time, just decided I was not getting the fulfillment that I really wanted from that. So I stepped away from the practice, went into HR and training where I gathered a ton of useful experience around how working with people and procedures. And that was a lot of fun. But having that clinical background, I really, really just had that urge to get back into wellness. At the time, I'm from Indianapolis, was about the time that population health and data analytics was really coming into its own space as far as within the health and welfare industry. So I joined a local benefits broker firm where I acted as a population health strategist, where I was hands-on and using their claims data working with their consultants to really understand and decipher that data for them and use that to develop their benefit strategies and think about their wellness programming and the implications of that data from a population health standpoint. So I worked there for several years, but had the opportunity to join Springbuck at the time, our director of health strategy, which was a small group of individuals that was doing a very similar function and then have Practiced into a couple different roles as far as within Springbuck, and then, as I mentioned, currently now sit as our enterprise practice leader. Yeah, so great. Such an interesting kind of path. You're a little ahead of your time to actually leave something to really align more with your purpose. <laughs> now everybody's doing that, but you, you said, hey, I got to do this now. So yeah. there's probably people who know this, but talk a little bit about we used to call it data warehouse. Now mm -hmm. it's integrated data warehouse, whatever. You know, Springbuck is a great example of it. But talk to us about what employers are doing around this data issue in general. Yeah. So as you mentioned, data warehouse is kind of that more legacy type term that is oftentimes thrown around it, but it's still important because it's still really the foundation of what we do. So employers, you know, having medical claims or a medical provider carrier, as well as their pharmacy provider eligibility, all of that data that wraps around their health benefits, obviously usually is number one as far as on their, you know, cost spreadsheet, as far as so much money goes out the door related to healthcare spend. Mm -hmm. So in knowing that and knowing that that trajectory is not slowing down anytime soon, they need to be able to really get their hands around what's happening and understand what opportunities do they have to help control that cost. And that's really where, you know, having a data warehouse to house all of that data comes into play. We slowly have transpired into, you know, data analytics, which applied a little bit of visualization on top of that data. So you didn't necessarily have to be pulling a bunch of queries or having you know, extremely like an analyst be able to pull all that data. So it was a little bit more user-friendly. And at Springwalk, we take that a step further into what we call health intelligence, which runs all the algorithms on the back end for our users. You know, where are those cost opportunities? Where can we help our population and identify those clear opportunities that benefits leaders can use the data for as far as to help drive decisions? And whether that's plan design changes or specific programs to put in place, to really help their employees and population. Yeah, I think I've shared with the group here, you know, I have varied background, but I've been working with employers for decades and data is so foundational, but often it's pretty fragmented. You might have more than one carrier, you might have a different PBM, you might have different carriers, different point solutions that we'll get into. And it's really hard to just see that information in a clear integrated way. I think everybody's trying to have informed insights, right? Not just yeah. the data. And so this health intelligence idea makes a lot of sense. 
you know, you were telling me that you've looked at just recently the book of business you have and have a few findings from that. So I want to get into some key insights and some conversations, but if, tell me a little bit about, I think you called it the annual health trends report. Tell us a little bit about that. And I don't know if we can have access to it. I don't know if you post it online or not, but at least some of the findings and more about what you're finding in your book of business data. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we produce this report annually. It's by far probably our most viewed or downloaded just because there's so much good content in it. So this year that, you know, included data from over 4,200 employers, it equates to over 4 million lives. And it's really the opportunity for our team, which you know, it's our data scientists and those that, you know, are physicians on the staff that have the opportunity to really analyze this data at an aggregate perspective. And the four main trends that we pulled out for this year focused around cancer. And that's a big one. We always know a lot of cost is attributed to cancer, but it's the first year, and we saw this as well as the business group on health's large employer survey, that the cost of cancer has overtaken MSK for the first time, which is, again, a pretty big deal when you think about small number of people. Right. So that's really interesting as we think about we're still seeing an increase in the number of people, but it's really the cost that was driving that a little bit more than just the number increase in people. It was interesting because we all know in 2020, when everything shut down, there was this fear that people weren't getting their preventive screenings and that slowly but surely we would start to see this increase in rate of cancer. Again, we saw a little bit of a jump as far as from 2021 to 22. It wasn't as big as 2020 to 2021. But again, it's really the cost, and a lot of that's related to specialty drugs, which takes us into our second topic around specialty drugs as a whole. That, I think, again, we talk about the increasing costs around healthcare, primarily driven by specialty drugs. We do see some bright lights out there where we have the opportunity with biosimilars that are coming to market. Right. You know, it's interesting as you look at biosimilars that are available through the medical channel versus what's available through a pharmacy channel and all the factors that come into play. Probably not the right venue to <laughs> go into all those details, but again, please feel free to download the report on our website. Site of infusion is another yes. one. So there are a lot of things because that's been on the rise for a long time, the total Rx spend, yep. but especially drugs. I think employers feel like this is out of control for me, mm -hmm. sending $100,000 a month. We have million yep. dollar drugs now. So that's super interesting. What were the other two? You said there were four? Yeah. The other two, we've actually been tracking for the past two, three years now. The first one being mental health, which obviously can be a huge broad topic. But we're specifically really looking at it and updating it from the trend around utilization of telehealth to treat mental health. When everything went virtual in 2020, we saw this dramatic increase in telemedicine utilization for mental health services. They were able to really turn those services around so quickly. And it's really maintained its stake in that you know, top category as far as with telemedicine diagnoses, which I think is fantastic that, you know, we have a great avenue for people to very easily get their toes in as far as to get access to providers. And it's really been, you know, significant as I believe we saw over 30% of total mental health claims were provided via telemedicine. Mm -hmm. And of all of our telemedicine claims, 60% of those were for mental health. So that is, you know, again, probably one of the bright linings if we can say there's a bright lining from the COVID pandemic, that's really a big win as far as being able to shift that type of care. And then the last one was just looking at cost around COVID. And we've looked at this from a couple different lenses over the past few years, but this year we looked at it from a long COVID perspective. And I think what we all thought was that we would see this huge amount of claims related to the long COVID diagnosis. And we saw anything but that. It was really about one to 2% of our total claims. So we took a pretty methodical approach and thoughtful approach to how we would define long COVID and looking at the common symptoms that are used to diagnose long COVID. And to no one's surprise, we certainly saw a significant increase in costs from a per claimant perspective of people who at one point in time had an inpatient stay related to COVID so then we're looking, you know, as they have two, three or more types of symptoms related to long COVID, their costs just continue to increase over yeah. time. Yeah, no, it's a very tricky one because even people who didn't have inpatient experiences, there's yep. reports that they have long COVID. So 
I have a question about this integrated data and let's talk mental health for a second. When I was working with clients, there was always this analytics where they would say your primary condition. So you would have cancer, MSK, whatever, and you were only in one of those categories. And usually there was some hierarchy, like, you know, congestive heart failure is worse than <laughs> diabetes or something mm -hmm. like that. So even if you have both, you're categorized with your primary. And then there were some comorbidities. But then what I was trying to do a thing that said, I don't care about primary. I want to know all my diabetics, everyone who's living with diabetes, give me them and then tell me every other thing they have. So they probably have some hypertension. They may have this. And behavioral health, when we did that analysis, what we called verticals, on this. So they were not independent because you could have MSK and diabetes. But when you just looked at these things, behavioral health, mental health issues were a pretty significant theme across that. Yeah. Do you yep. do that kind of analysis? And if you do, what kind of things do you see when you look at people that way, more holistically? We do. And I think you just made that point right there. It's we really can no longer look at conditions as a siloed approach. You have to think about the whole person because you can't just treat one condition and think that it doesn't have some type of other impact on everything else that's going on with that individual. We have, as part of the intelligence portion of our platform, what we call insight cards. And one of those specifically looks at and identifies members that have a mental health condition and at least one other chronic condition. Because to your point, we know that when a member has, let's say it's diabetes or it's you know heart failure, and they have depression or anxiety with that, it amplifies the effect of any other chronic condition that they have. Not just from you know a cost perspective, but just in, you need to be able to take that into account as far as as you're treating those individuals. It's again, it's this holistic approach to the individual that I think has been slow to come as far as from a healthcare perspective. I think we're seeing much more of that from ancillary types of benefits that are offered as you think about, you know, a lot more wellness or total well-being programs that are being offered tend to address more of that mental health and how that impacts every other condition. And I think if we've learned, you know, anything from 2020 and beyond, it's that our mental health is extremely fragile. And if we're not taking care of that, it will spill over and roll down and have catastrophic events. So we have to be able to really understand that full impact. You know, one of the key core opportunities is to be able to look at people who have multiple chronic conditions and understand not only, yes, it's costly, but how complicated that is for that individual as well to try to understand the type of care that they need and understand that from an individual perspective. Well, so that is a quasi helpful segue for me to talk <laughs> about this idea of health literacy, because as you mm -hmm. said, it gets complicated. So from a health literacy perspective and a health equity perspective, I've been thinking a lot about this issue and thinking that for so long, the healthcare industry really hasn't progressed when it comes to the kind of information that people get. They've been a little bit better about it. But really, even the CDC changed their definition of health literacy to go, there's an organizational health literacy. So organizations need to provide easy to understand information, but there's personal health literacy. And that's the idea of helping people have the knowledge, skills, and confidence to navigate their own health journeys, whether it's a well journey or someone with chronic conditions or multiple conditions. So what we talk about is this idea of health literacy 2.0, using Behavioral science and gamification combined with data to personalize and create analytics combined with multimedia interactive sources. Everyone learns by YouTube. You're going to go yep. to knee surgery. You go get a YouTube to see what that's going to look like, right? You go online for podcasts to learn about things. So why are we still providing a little drawing in the doctor's office where she says how she's going to cut your knee? So I feel very strongly that health literacy, and we know from the data that this improves outcomes, quality, mm -hmm. experience, all these things. And yet I don't see it really talked about a lot in the industry. I see advocacy programs, navigation programs. I see a lot of demands on patients and people. What's your take on that? Is it a gap? Are you seeing some of this? Or is it a conversation? Or 
Am I early to the game on this? What's happening? I think it's a huge gap. I mean, the healthcare system is so complex and it's not getting any easier. And people who have spent years in the industry still sometimes struggle to understand everything that they need to know. And I think when you distill that down to, you know, the average American who is oftentimes trying to get help or needs to see a doctor, I mean, heaven forbid it's in an emergency situation, they most oftentimes only know to go to the ER. And we have to be able to provide that education and understanding prior to those events or when it's time to go, they're not going to know what to do. When we work with our groups, a lot of our recommendations oftentimes is, you know, open enrollment is obviously a great time to talk about your full benefit package, but that shouldn't be the only time you're talking about your benefit package. Mental health, oftentimes we talk about this a lot as well, as far as people need to know what to do when it's crisis mode or, you know, when they only have a few minutes and they've got to be able to reach out to someone, they need to know what all those options are. And so I think it's a huge gap oftentimes when we talk about social determinants of health. I know we were talking about that earlier as yeah, well. Right. To be able to connect all of these dots, you have to be able to meet your population where they are. And one benefit of having a data warehouse or an analytic system, you need to be able to slice that. Maybe it's by location or by division or by zip code to be able to understand what may be the barriers in some of those instances and make sure that the information you're sharing is accurate and it can resonate with them and it can, again, connect them to the right types of care and the right types of education. In your database, do you collect, for example, you know, for a long time, it was called health risk assessments or health assessment mm -hmm. or personal health assessment. Do you incorporate that in, with some of your clients? Some of them are starting to ask questions about, you know, in the past six months, have you been at any time, not had enough money to buy groceries or mm -hmm. what have you. Are you seeing some of that data now being collected and incorporated? We do have a few groups that are bringing in some of that HRA type of survey. I will say the challenge with that oftentimes is we often get that anonymized. So it becomes challenging to try to marry that up to the types of claims that we have that is at you know the individual level. But it does certainly allow us to still see, you know, even if it's from an aggregate perspective, it allows you to see where there may be, you know, some hot issues or some opportunities to try to close some of those gaps. Now, we have still seen employers that, again, based upon their culture or the size of the organization, oftentimes where they have a really good connection with their employees, where there could be some more specific types of information that's collected where we could maybe at least get down to like a division level or state or location type of level that again could give them some insight into what might be some issues around those areas as they think about designing benefits to be specific to those populations and not necessarily just broad based strokes from a benefit perspective. Yeah. And we've seen, and we encourage employers to have some items. We do it on our Edlogix platform we have obviously health literacy questions, but even back when I was at Optum, we incorporated some health literacy questions in the health assessment. So there's a couple very simple ones like, you know, when you're doing a health insurance form, do you need assistance? Almost everybody mm -hmm. does, but <laughs> you know, it's pretty, <laughs> right. hard, uh, pretty complicated, but there are a couple of questions that don't feel like they're so intrusive, right? Because again, mm -hmm. employers are walking a fine line there. Yeah terms yeah. of what to do. But I would encourage people who are listening to think about how you're understanding the social essential needs that people have, as well as those health literacy and advocacy and navigation skills that people have. Because as you just mentioned, we have lots of benefits we're offering people, but people really only listen when they need it. It's not exactly. always in October when it's open enrollment, right? Yeah. Um, and we've seen some groups that have been really creative. So they'll almost have a hierarchy. So if they know that, because you'll see this from HR, if someone gets married or they have a baby or they get divorced, like there's those types of changes. There is a very soft push of certain communication. Like if you need it, we have XYZ type of benefits available. So that again is another way to try to meet people where they are in their life situations too. I thought that was a really creative way to again, think about people need to know it in the instant. And that's a way to continue to communicate. Yeah. Life stage type mm -hmm. of life events, communications, 
Are you seeing that at the individual level or you're saying you look at broad data and you know, we're having a lot of babies in our company, so we're going to promote the maternal and family benefits or is it a little of both? A little bit of both. Often it will depend on the size of the employer as far as how granular they want to get on that. Yeah. It's so interesting. So let's get a little nerdy and talk data again because uh, <laughs> it's so relevant, right? How we look at data and it's sometimes very frustrating. Again, I've worked with so many clients and they're so frustrated at the reports they get or the analytics and to your earlier comment, people, they want the data, but what they want is the insights and mm -hmm. they want actionable you know, recommendations and they want some help in how to prioritize and balance what to do and what not to do. Yeah, I know I have a high spend in cancer. What do I do about it kind of thing? Data enrichment is a term that, you know, is often used around this where you create, for example, an activation or an engagement index or things like that. What are you kind of thinking about that really helps employers take it from just kind of raw data mm -hmm. to somehow you've combined the data in a way to say, oh yeah, we know on in general, your population compares to others on engaging in benefits or using healthcare system more preventive services. Do you have any thoughts on that? So we do. It's funny you say enrichment and I think about like the enrichment that we do around ETGs and sure. <laughs> risk groupers and those kinds of things. So a little bit different as far as with enrichment, but we almost look at it as far as like with benchmarking, number one okay. is to understand okay, well, I'm here, but how does that, you know, potentially relate to the rest of your Springbok book of business or mm -hmm. from an industry perspective? And I think there's a couple different ways to play on that. Well, I think it's oftentimes helpful just to know, you know, get a quick gut check as far as where you stand against potentially maybe some of your competitors or others in your industry. It's still important to know your own trends. You know, some of those you want to see yeah, go sure. up and some you want to see go down. But when we think about, you know, from a benefit offering, we get a lot of people that will ask like, hey, we're losing people to XYZ type company because we're hearing our premiums are too high or we don't have this type of benefit. And again, that comes a lot into a benchmarking perspective. And that's where we traditionally will help our groups as far as kind of understand what we're seeing out in the marketplace. And really to your question, as far as connecting the dots as far as with what we see from the insights. So we help with that roadmap as far as, you know, we see X problem and then the solutions could be, you know, as we think about a crawl, walk, run type of approach where some of it may just be communication or education. It may be putting a new program in place or it may be providing specific incentives. That is where, you know, we try to stay agnostic as far as within the market and not necessarily say you need this diabetes solution or this care management, because we know each of those can be unique based upon the employer. Some of that could be regionalized, but we want them to make sure that they know what those opportunities are. Then once a solution is chosen, we complete the circle as far as really collecting that data and that data can go out and it can come back in as far as we could essentially help those additional solutions. But then we also take in the data back from those solutions to really understand, are they still continuing to drive them to the right locations or are they really connecting with, mm -hmm. you know, and, and addressing the right types of gaps in care to be able to have that closed loop as far as from a data perspective? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, there's lots of benchmarks out there, even external benchmarks mm -hmm. by industry or by various, you know, small, large size companies. I'm also just really interested because of the broader interest in health equity. And one of the areas of health equity, as I mentioned, of course, is health literacy, but another is kind of a health disparity in terms of access. I know this is tricky, some of your clients, are they collecting race, ethnicity data? What are you seeing in your business around that? There's still a lot of hesitation around that. I would say we get asked that question a lot mm -hmm. as far as could you take in this type of data? And then when we get to you know the implementation point in time when we're bringing in that eligibility, there's oftentimes just still some sensitivity around that and hesitancy to do that. So as of right now, we're not bringing that in. But I think the more we talk about health equity, the more we talk about SDOH, I think 
will start to be able to pull that back a little bit and understand that there is some real value to having that data and to be able to use it in a way that we can take the healthcare data and ensure that we're really applying it truly from a health equity perspective to ensure that you're using it for the right reasons and you're really trying to ensure that everyone truly has access to the right things that they need and ensure that everyone has the right opportunities. I think we're still probably maybe a couple of years away from that. I don't know. I'll probably wake up tomorrow and we'll have five people that want to integrate it, but who knows? So after they've listened yeah. to this, that's right. <laughs> that's right. But, you know, we've worked with groups who are part of larger consortiums where they are supplying that type of data. And there may have been some specific, like, maternal care programs that they put in place to understand there's huge gaps that we know as far as from a race perspective. And again, that's really the value. And I think the outcomes everybody wants to be able to use that for, there's still so much hesitation, I think, just from a sensitivity around that type of data. Yeah. So for me, there's a couple things that we could leave people with, but in terms of data, Obviously, you're getting your claim, medical claims data, your Rx claims data, behavioral health claims data. That's great. And that needs to be integrated. Then you have all your separate vendors. Maybe you have a wellness vendor, maybe you have a, a smoking cessation, EAP, whatever. If you can integrate those, great. If you can start to pull in some of your business metrics, you mentioned disability work, maybe you can pull in absence or other kinds of data, great. And that's kind of been the conversation for a long time, frankly. But the new level of data, SDOH data, health literacy data, race, ethnicity, sexual preference, orientation data, those things are what we are starting to see are really not only driving costs, but driving disparities or illustrate the disparities that would then allow us to really understand, to your point, the insights. What am I missing? Anything else? If you had a plea to your clients about let us bring this in or let us do that, what are you kind of asking or seeing as a gap? I think you hit on the majority of those. The one other one that we talked about that I know I got really geeked out on was yeah. the 401k contributions, because uh, I yes. think that is a couple different ways to view that, not only from you know understanding who is not contributing versus who's maxing out. How does that set them up for retirement? Knowing if, you know, you have people from a demographic age standpoint that are, you know, over 45, over 50 that aren't contributing at all, we know they're going to have chronic conditions. So is this setting them up to continue to be on the plan longer because they can't afford to retire? And then added costs from that perspective to understanding hardship withdrawals and how that plays into, are they on the wrong type of plan and they can't meet deductible. So they're having a withdrawal from retirement. Well, that, you know, serves right into the whole health literacy. So they probably didn't know what type of plan to sign up for, or maybe because that was the cheapest option from a paycheck standpoint, but they didn't understand as far as the real implications of that. So that's the only other one I'd probably say I would add, because again, I think there's so many different implications around that kind of data. And it gets really, really exciting as far as to think how we can continue to connect all the dots and really understand the whole health equity and health literacy piece. It's great. Financial data. I also, again, you know, think about the HSA data mm -hmm. as well, health savings yep. account data and are people doing it and are they pulling it out the wrong way? So all of those can be really good indicators that people are either misreading it and need help that way or are truly in hardship. Well, Jen, thank you so much. This has been great. We might have to have a part two at some point. <laughs> Love it. We will try to post a link for the annual health trends, but if they just go to springbuck.com, can they download it there? Is that how it works? They can. Absolutely. Yep. It'll be okay. on our front page. And Buck is UK or UC? UK. Yep. Right. Exactly. That's what I yep. thought. Okay. Well, again, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And thank you everyone for joining us.